And today's interlocutor is actually with us by Zoom because she's actually in Victoria from Australia, but not doing well um, because, because plane travel does that. And so Anna Halifoff, uh, Dr. Anna Halifoff is with us. Uh, she's a workshop participant, another dear friend and collaborator with me and Mar on lots of things. And Anna is probably Australia's leading scholar on contemporary spiritual and religious phenomena. Anna is a professor of sociology at Deakin University in Melbourne. And after Anna and Mar and I talk, I'll share a, sort of an open conversation for about 20 minutes. Now, but before I share Mar with you, I want to acknowledge and respect for the Kwangan peoples on whose traditional territory the university stands, and the Songhees, Esquimalt, and the Sanish peoples whose historical relationships with the land continue to this day. And so please join me in welcoming my dear friend and colleague, Mar. Thank you. Thank you very much, Boss, for inviting me here, for being a colleague for mm -hmm. that many years. But also thank you to Rachel for being that helpful at, uh, every moment, uh, Scott. And, and also I'm very happy to see some uh, friend faces here, like Geraldine. So I'm, uh, as Paul explained, I'm Margarita. I'm from Barcelona. And I'm going to explain you something. The problem is that when I started to prepare this presentation, I had the feeling that I didn't know exactly what the story should I tell to you. When we talk about holistic spirituality and we talk about uh, yoga, Reiki, and all these kind of practices, and we try to explain what's going on there, usually we choose what, what type of story we want to explain, uh, what, what's the final message that we would like to get. And, and, and to some extent, this kind of... Uh, Thoughts always get encapsulated into the big debate about are these spirituality kind of liberating spiritualities or are these spiritualities kind of putting us in a in a in a difficult or or, or, or kind of making us uh, complicit with the neoliberal agenda. So I was there trying to make sense about how, how what to explain it to you. And then on my way to Victoria, something happened. <laughs> <laughs> I was in a plane, in a Canada plane, uh, half an hour far from Barcelona, and uh, a group of birds, this is a Starling, a starling uh, group of birds, collided with, uh, with the plane, and uh, we had a kind of uh, an accident, so the plane started to shake, and, uh, oh. and the pilot say as the uh, no worry. <laughs> we really worry. <laughs> no worry. Everything is going to be fine, but we have to head up to, uh, to go back to Barcelona. Everyone is starting to kind of panic. Uh, one little uh, baby was crying, you know, this kind of crying that gets you. Uh, and I, was, I didn't exactly know what to do. So I put my headphones and, and I started with my Kundalini. <laughs> my Kundalini. <laughs> I'm doing some pranayama, some kundalini, while on my uh, mind I was trying to send good vibes to the pilot in order that he <laughs> tried to do his best and we got to Barcelona. You know, I was really frightened, so I, I, I was scared and I didn't know what to do. And this was exactly what came to my mind. And then I was preparing the presentation. I thought, is this spirituality? Mm. Is this... Mm, why I, I, I went to my Kundalini uh, <laughs> mantra, I have to, to say that I was trained as a Kundalini a yoga teacher, but part of my field work that I was doing in prison. So the Kundalini mantras are there, something that, but how could I explain it, this? Uh, and then, and I, and I will show you why this kind of part of me in a way. I try to make sense, okay, what's exactly going on with spirituality? You know? So is this a spirituality? Is something else? Uh, how we might make sense of it? And if we, if we analyze what the, 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 how the spiritual landscape is evolving nowadays, we see that it's many kind of pieces that really don't fit. And as a sociologist and anthropologist, we really don't know how to explain what's going on. On the one side, we have all these spirituals, but not religious. On the other side, there are some people that say that they are really spiritual, but they are also religious. Then there's this, all this uh, wellness uh, market industry. Even we can find nowadays uh, many web pages like uh, giving us uh, what it's called global spiritu spirituality industry statistics. 
but then we talk about nature, ecology, all these new ecological movements that uh, deal with these ideas of sacred nature. And as, and as a sociologist, in a way, uh, how we try to explain it and, and how we try to make sense of, of, of all these types of spirituality. And I would say that we are kind of trapped or we are kind of uh, in three main narratives. So when we try to explain why I, I, I was with my Kundalini mantra list or what, uh, how we might explain, usually we, we use three different narratives. And I'm going for the first one. The first one is what I say, the skeptic's tale or, or the aspiration for the real religion. What I mean this in a very kind of uh, non-polite way, it would say, it would be what uh, some professors say, this is bullshit. So uh, <laughs> this is not really anything at all. Uh, I remember Peter Berger, I, I spent some time in Boston with the sociologist Peter Berger and we talk a lot about religion and spirituality. And I really uh, like him and we were good at but when it came to spirituality, he was clear. This is this doesn't, this has not a community. If there's not a community, if there's no institution, this is not gonna last. So this is just some people making weird things. So he would have say, you man, sometimes get them crazy. And this kind of plain <laughs> thing got you in a difficult position, but this is not a spirituality at all. But also, for instance, uh, in a more serious way, uh, Mark Chavez, for instance, also says, no, actual religious content seems to be necessary to sustain an effort like this. Like to, 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 so th these are the type of scholars that think that, uh, in a way, spirituality is only a kind of an, a reflex of, of the real religion, but not real religion. Then there is a, the second tale, in a way, the second narrative that gets popular. And this is a scientific tale, no? it's a, this role of scientifying spirituality, or what they say, how the lab gets into the spiritual scene. And this usually from scholars coming from uh, health uh, science or physical science, they, they usually talk about the spirituality from the science perspective, then they are able to explain it. And maybe they will explain my Kundalini mantras saying, uh, you needed something to that your mind and your brain and you have to. So the, the explanation about the spirituality would go or would come from the, from the scientific side. And we can see also how there's uh, really efforts, and I'm not going to talk about this in this in this presentation, but uh, we just wrote a paper analyzing how uh, spiritual milieus try to get validated through scientific uh, means, like, for instance, uh, using experiments to validate, publishing uh, journals, articles, using, so, uh, and we see that this is an also an important number. The, the third one, and maybe the more important for the social science scholars is the neoliberal tale, or what I said, our pledge of guilt. No? So to an extent, uh, what, how we can explain this spirituality and the, and the growth of this spirituality, we used to say that this is uh, related with uh, the, the emergence of neoliberalism, but also the, 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 the expansion of the spiritual supermarket. No? And here, for instance, I put the spiritual supermarket, but also the selling yoga of the Asian cook, but also books that I really like, yeah, but, but they go here. And I also put my own book that I wrote 20 years ago, and it also went into this direction, and I'm not really proud of, but it was uh, <laughs> it was consuming religion. No? So, uh, and, and we have been there, and, and our narrative mainly has been uh, portraying holistic spirituality as market-driven spirituality, so and, and articulated through a logic of consumption. And, and as a sociologist, anthropologist, we have been kind of reaffirming uh, this idea, but also anchored in this uh, contemporary rise of individualism. And, and this is something that we keep repeating all the time, that the holistic spirituality is individualist, that, that is, uh, and, and, and many times even uh, saying that is related with this narcissism Individualism, the individualism, the, the Shailenism in a way uh, that uh, uh, that Bella put forward, but but this idea that that the, the look or the aspiration of spirituality is really rooted in in around uh, specific needs, but also and this idea that it reinforces an ideology of passivity and holds an elective affinity uh, with neoliberalism and, and in this sense using 
the idea of the classical pro uh, Bavarian idea of the elective affinity between the, the Protestant ethic and the, and the capitalism, we will say that the, the, this holistic spirituality holds a, a, an elective affinity with neoliberalism and, and in a way they reinforce each other. But also that it's rooted in cultural appropriation and the banalization of primarily Eastern religions. No? So, and, and this has been the, 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 the more kind of uh, hegemonic portrait that from social science we have been uh, using to explain uh, holistic spirituality. However, and here I, I, I would not deny this uh, portrait, I would not uh, directly confront it. My, my talk finally, it, it was called Challenge. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> challenging. Um, uh, challenging views on spirituality, but in fact, I would not challenge them. I would navigate through them, and, and this is something important. This this kind of portrait is still there, and it's it's totally real. But however, if we try to go a bit further, we see that in a way, we, we as a sociologist, as anthropologists, we're caught in this hamster wheel, and we keep saying that the spirituality reinforces neoliberalism and all its devils, but at the same time, neoliberalism and all its devils reinforce spirituality. So we keep in this tautology in a way, and we are not able to uh, get out of it. So what we should know better, no? and, and, and here taking uh, Paul's uh, question really as, a, as, a, as an invitation to think beyond. No? And we, we know that we have these three narratives, and the three narratives might, uh, the three of them, uh, be able to tell a story, but as, as, a, as a sociologist, but also as a practitioner, as, as, as me, someone that can uh, go through a kundalini uh, mantra list in order to deal with my anxiety. What, what, what this can help me to, to see, uh, I'm this kind of uh, person totally coped by neoliberalism and, and helping with my practice too, or, or there's something else. And, and here I think that it's, my answer is kind of very basic, but it's about the need to ask and listen. And, and I was preparing this talk and I remember three different companies that I think that they are uh, authors or, or thinkers that can help us to, to go through this question. No, first is Donna Haraway, you know, and I really like this quote that what she says, corrosive skepticism cannot be midwives to new stories. So to what extent uh, how this narrative about neoliberal, neoliberal spirituality is, is driving us to this kind of corrosive skepticism that doesn't allow us to see so anything else. We are just in this kind of frame. But also the, the second one, which is very basic, but very important in, in this kind of research. And it's, I learned so much from listening to people. And, 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 and I will show you why I think that this is something very relevant. And finally, uh, I'm not sure if you know Vincent Despret, but uh, she's uh, an amazing uh, anthropologist from Belgium. And she has a very nice uh, book called uh, What uh, Animals Would Say If We Would Make the Right Questions. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's I, I really recommend it to you. Uh, but he has a, she has a, a kind of a quote together in article with Hood that she says, attending to how we inquire as much as to the response we elicit is crucial. So, how, what I what I what I would like to say with this. So, and, and I let me go to my field work in order to uh, get more concrete and get into the into the into the basic. I'm gonna take my notes because I just have to talk like this and then. Uh, so. Go, my field work, I've been doing in field work in holistic spirituality for many, for many years, but here I will talk to you about two different field work sites and try to explain a little bit. The first was the practice of yoga in penitentiary centers, and the second is the, the one that I'm doing nowadays about women spiritual healers in Girona, which is a city in Catalonia, in the rural Catalonia, and Taquarambo in Uruguay among indigenous uh, community women. All of my field works are always I've done in collaboration, so I have uh, to say that I have many friends and colleagues who I work with, and I should acknowledge this. Let me go to the first one. And, and uh, yoga and, uh, in prison and its popularization. I, I will not go really deeply into it, but just to give you a hint of what I did. I started 
uh, doing field work in prison because I was doing field work for a project on religious diversity. And one day, while walking in a high security prison, I saw a, ban a banner uh, saying that you know, they were your classes. And I started to ask, uh, what's going on? Is, there, is this popular here? And I just realized that every prison in Catalonia had a yoga course. And that this was super popular, and this was not only an exception, or this was not an exception in Catalonia, but it, it happens in many parts of the world. And, and yoga in carceral programs is, is very famous. And I started to think, why yoga and what's going on? And and just to uh, this is very popular. It's done by volunteers. Uh, there's kind of weekly classes, uh, courses, but also, for instance, I have spent many, a lot of time in a quarantine uh, yoga course. So it was 40 days in a row with uh, 15 inmates, two hours per day. So it's really Kundalini yoga, not only Kundalini, but uh, Kundalini yoga mostly. So you can imagine the people in prison, yes. Uh, singing the, the mantras and, and, mm -hmm. and doing breath of fire but uh so so what was really clear is that it was not a kind of a, 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 a physical activity that was detached from the spiritual side but it was a highly spiritualized form of yoga uh it was justified in secular terms but it was highly spiritual and it was implemented through what they call yoga entrepreneurs. So usually yoga volunteers that uh, offer themselves to the prison in order to teach uh, courses. And the prison usually said yes. They saw yoga as a non-dangerous uh, activity for security reasons. So it was there. When I started this research, and, and now I'm going to go with, uh, with where I asked before, my question was, what is this? So what's this? Is this religion? Is this spirituality? Is this uh, some kind of... Uh, just a physical activity, how we might explain that yoga is happening to the prison. And my and the neoliberal tale came, uh, brought me to say, okay, this is uh, something that goes with the neoliberalization of, of, of prisons and this idea of the self-optimization of the subject. And this is a form of disciplining the bodies and so on, so on, so on. And I did this discourse and it was good enough. But then I asked her to, to what I was saying before, no? to what extent uh, should we keep going with this type of questions? So the question of what it is, and, and or maybe we should ask them, what does yoga do for them? And, and instead of, and this is been seen the spread proposal, instead of asking what it is, ask what does it do, what, what it provokes, no? what it admires, and take the answer, the answer seriously. No? So, Keep listening and, and, and try to understand what they are saying and, and put the subject into the, into the middle of the research. And here everything started to feel a little bit different. And for instance, this was a quote from Jason, one, um, one inmate from Mexico that was uh, really involved into the yoga course. And she said, he said, yoga connects me with the divinity. divinity. Years ago, I smoked marijuana. I have also taken drugs. And with yoga, I have felt similar sensations. However, this is not a drug. This is not false. This is not hypocritical. And this is not happening because someone else is giving me drugs. This doesn't come from outside. This comes from inside of me. It comes from my own serenity. And I feel, and I feel happy with myself. I feel happy. And I am able to understand my context. I see how things really are. And I say to myself, I feel so good. And this was another one. No, I, I know things that uh, to be here may also be an opportunity. It's like a temple, and you need to be strong and train and discipline your body, your mind, and your your mind and your soul. So I I, I just started to 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 think about these quotes, about these interviews in another way. You no, know, instead of and trying to keep the this idea of neoliberalism, non-neoliberalism outside of the game, and what it means to them. You no, know? and we also asked after one very nice session in which uh, there was some live music and some yoga, we asked them to just paint what it happened to them in this, in this, this yoga class, no? And uh, images like this uh, were painted by the, by the maids. So, and, and here I start to ask, what, what do you yoga practice do to inmates? No? So to what extent, uh, how we can understand uh, the role of these yoga practices? The first is that, in a way, it helps to counter self-mortification. 
there's this uh, transcendence and, and some restoration of the of the of what uh, Erwin Goffman calls the territories of the self. Erwin Goffman, I guess that you are familiar with him and his work in the in the prisons. But he said that the, the, the most painful thing in the prison is that you are not allowed to have intimacy and your own things and 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 what it belongs to you. So. Uh, yoga in a way directly address this and I'm going to show you how. And the second important part of the answer it was that, that yoga and the practice of yoga and what, what was involved in this practice uh, was generating a spiritual stock of knowledge. This is a concept from Alfred Schutz, this idea that it's, it's a kind of uh, knowledge that give you some ideas about life and about meaning and about uh, the rest of it. And how the yoga does this. So uh, the first thing is that to what extent when we analyze the, 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 what was happening in the, in the yoga class, we realize that the, the, the yoga was creating a spiritual atmosphere. It's not just the yoga. It's not just doing an asana after an asana. It's the creation of a specific atmosphere with the smell escape, the sound escape, the touch, the voice. So it's the, uh, it's the generation of this atmosphere with can create some feeling of spirituality and some feeling of entering what uh, Alfred should say is a, a finite province of meaning. Alfred should use this expression of finite province of meaning to, to, to indicate when uh, you live an, uh, an a spiritual experience and when the, 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 um, the flow of the time and the space, the space in a way breaks. It's this moment that you, you, you feel that you are in another space. You are not here in this time, not here in this space, but you enter uh, to some other place, and, and it's difficult to explain. There are many also phenomenologies that try to explain what's going on there. No, but what was clear is, was that uh, the yoga was not alone, so it was not this. It was this creation of this uh, uh, this atmosphere, and also the work on the body. And this was uh, very important in prison. Meditation did not work uh, the same as as yoga. Uh, the, the 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 use of the body and the embodied. Uh, the, the, embodying all this, this, this kind of knowledge allow the inmates to, to generate a different relation uh, with the body, but also a process of uh, kind of authentication through their own bodies that something was changing. So it was not just something that was happening out of the group, it was something that my body is changing, my body is feeling different, and now I walk different, and I breathe different. And, and, and this embodying in a way was validating this, 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 this thing. There are many other things that I'm not going to go uh, really deep into it, but also the group as a symphony. And here it was, for instance, after a yoga quarantine, uh, 40 days in a row with the same uh, people, 15 people. The, the group was very important, important in generating this atmosphere and in creating uh, what I have, uh, what, what um, Johnson say, a sanctuary in a way, a, a different emotional register that allowed, for instance, that an inmate, an inmate could cry or another one uh, could just uh, shout or another one. So express all these emotions and generate this. So, and this, but this is one part of the story. This is the story of these uh, transcendence moments that allow these inmates in a way feel that they are somewhere else and, and allow these moments of, 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 of Disconnection from the from the dirty and the noisy place of the prison, uh, and and here two 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 quotations from an inter, from an interview that help to to understand also the, the second part of this. One quotation is: Before I speak or do something, I breathe and look inside to see if I really mean it or do it and how to do it. I try to vibrate in the frequency of love. It was kind of shocking this idea of vibrating in the frequency of love, and then. This other woman that I it say, I feel pain, I breathe, I close the eyes, I look at my pain, and I wait to see what the pain wants to tell me. What's behind these quotes? No, and and and, and this is where I call that there's uh, this body and the self in conversation. It's not just that something is happening in the terms of, of, of the breathing, but also is that I explain it in terms of the frequency of love and why an inmate is talking in the such a terms and, and one another one is saying that I want I, I'm listening to my pain. These are discourses that clearly come from this holistic spiritual uh, milieu and conforms this stock of knowledge that is of out there is not maybe a, a kind of knowledge that is uh, is a, 
articulate it in a clear academic way, but it's 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 there. It's it's uh, they use a lot of uh, sources from the Bhagavad Gita, Yoga Sutras, but also Paulo Coelho and the film. So and and they can kind of mix all this uh, knowledge in a in a way that maybe uh, from an academic point of view, maybe uh, what I said this is bullshit. No, this 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 this, this but. It makes sense for them, and they use it in a way to narrate and make sense of their life. And, and here it was the, the, the second interesting side of the story, that all this knowledge that was made of bits and pieces and was talking about frequencies of love, but also about karma, but also about the, the, the prison as a, as a temple in a way, it, it generated a... a, a uh, it created a symbolic resource in order to explain why they were there, uh, why they losing their time because something the most painful thing in the prison is feeling that you are losing your time that your your, your life is, is kind of stuck there so the 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 feeling that you are not kind of losing your time you are not stuck but you are learning something you could uh, and and this made or uh, generate a different situation but also and, and, and to, to be uh, try to finish this part it generated non-expected consequences. And this, uh, it was interesting to see how all these inmates that were in the yoga course, and you, I was there for three, four years, so I could uh, really know some of them quite well. Uh, they learned the language, but this language is a stock of knowledge, this language of the frequency of love, the idea of the karma, the idea of that suffering, but you better, and so on and so on. But it's also the language that most of social educators and psychologists working in the prison were using. So in a way, the learning of yoga and the learning of all these languages allow them to play better the rehabilitated self and gave them a therapeutic language that uh, helped them to go through uh, many of the difficult stages that you go in the prison. So uh, why I explain all this to you, to show that if we change the question, if we stop asking uh, what it is, uh, it is spirituality that goes in favor of never, we, we, get, we get a much more complex story. And in order not to be too late, uh, let me go to the, to the second uh, fieldwork case. In, in this fieldwork, uh, is, now I'm involved in this fieldwork. I, I just was in Uruguay, in Tacuarembó, uh, in July, and this is uh, being done with Civil Avinia. And here the, the, the departure point was similar. We, we were, this was a project that came out a bit of, as a serendipity because we were analyzing, uh, we, the project was initially it was on analyzing people that rejects to get vaccinated due to spiritual reasons. So to what extent a spirituality works as an exploratory factor uh, for anti-vax attitudes. But I'm not gonna go into this project, then if you want, we can talk a little bit more. But we started to look or to get or to get closer to some women that were anti vax at the beginning, but then we realized that uh, there were much more going on. And we started this project comparing uh, spiritual healers, in a way, women that live in rural areas in Catalonia, and most of them are women that have uh, kind of um, abandoned their life, and now they are living in the rural area, and they are kind of uh, cultivating uh, gardens, and uh, maybe uh, being uh, yoga practitioners, meditation practitioners, herbal healers, so this type of profile. And also in Uruguay, we have been doing the field work in Tacuarembó together with Sibila, who is also part of the indigenous community with indigenous women. women. Many of them were living in the city before, and now they are living in the rural communities, and they are relearning, in a way, indigenous knowledge. In, I don't know if you are familiar with Uruguay, but Uruguay was, uh, for many years, it was told that there were no indigenous in Uruguay. So this was the, the, the kind of official narrative. But nowadays, there are many people that claim to be uh, from indigenous communities, and that claim, uh, and, and, and this comes together with uh, research and so on, but also that they are kind of generating a new movement. So we, we at the beginning when the same, we were trying to see 
what is this spirituality and do they have do these women have something in common in Uruguay and in Catalonia or and, and we try to compare the spiritual kind of knowledge ideas uh, it was very difficult so we got trapped in saying mm, is this the system the same it's not what type of belief do they have it was almost impossible to clearly and coherently articulate the system of belief of, of both groups and then to compare. But then it, might, it made much more sense when we started to ask what the spirituality does for this woman. And what we realized is that what connects them is not a specific definition of a spirituality and not a common ancestral knowledge, but the shared diagnosis and prognosis of the present. And this was something interesting because we, we as a sociologist and anthropologist, we keep uh, we use a lot of our time discussing in a way uh, to what extent these practices have some ancestrality or not, or they are reinventions or reconstructions, uh, are they legitimate reconstructions or not. And, 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 and maybe what was interesting in this case is to see that uh, what was common for this woman and was bringing what was uh, kind of articulating the spirituality it was this uh, political critique of contemporary modernity. Uh, the women in, in Uruguay, but also in, in Catalonia, kind of uh, developed their narrative through two main axes. The first one, it was a critique of on, on time and acceleration. They clearly uh, wanted or, or um, put forward that uh, our world is accelerated, capitalist economy is accelerating the world, and, and this acceleration goes in two directions, the external and the internal. And a spirituality, in a way, is a, is a, is, is, is a form of dealing and, or, or addressing this acceleration and a slowing the world. And the second main act that was uh, totally shared by both communities it was the idea of toxicity, the toxicity of the body and the toxicity of the planet. And this is well, this is the place that vaccines come, 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 come on, no? uh, come, come into the scene. Uh, this idea of toxicity really articulates this no, new moral um, economy on health, and this idea that uh, we live in this populated, uh, in this polluted world, and also in this polluted uh, body. So, and, and, and asking them to what extent or what this uh, diagnosis. Uh, generate, uh, we, we saw that for both groups, spirituality was a pathway to shape the future. It was not, uh, it was not something that, uh, that was looking back, but looking forward. Uh, they, they, they all, um, many of their practices were trying, it was trying to slow down modernity, trying to slow down the, the inner rhythm, but also the external rhythm. And, and, and we're not just a kind of uh, discursive practices or individual practices, but ma many of, of the practices were collective practices and were collective and public projects. Uh, and also this idea that uh, healing and cleaning were, were, were went together and this ritual creativity in, 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 in putting forward new ways of cleaning the body and cleaning the, the planet and how this cleaning the body goes in continuity with cleaning the planet. And also how this, uh, together with this idea of planetary health, for all of them, the idea of planetary health, that seems more a, a, an academic construct than a real um, embedded uh, concept, but it was always there, the idea of the connection of the, of the, of the world and how this uh, activism and spirituality meet. Because both groups, the group in Girona, but the group in Uruguay too, were really activists. So uh, their spirituality were not only related with specific practices trying to help clean the body or clean the, the immediate planet, but were together with uh, political projects in the case of Uruguay, for instance, stopping uh, an hydrogen plant that it's, uh, has to be built there. And, and, and it was this activism against this hydrogen, this hydrogen plant, what, what brought many of this group of women together in generating new narrative. Uh, and, and in Girona, it was trying to uh, create new forms of, of, of agriculture movements and a slow food uh, movement and so on. But, so what I what I wanted to to what it was clear in this in this research is that uh, that their spirituality was not detached from activism and not detached from 
from from this uh, diagnose about the present and this prognosis about the future, but it was really there. So in order to be finishing, uh, I, I I really like, I don't know if you are familiar with the work of Farah Otres, she's a professor in California and, and she's, uh, uh, it's very interesting. Her, she's more of a theoretical or political theorist, but she has very nice articles. And she has this one when, where she compares or where she kind of uh, work on Gandhi philosophy, but also yoga, and she said this, no, the fact that power relations are all pervasive do not suggest that we should give up on practices of the self, nor does it suggest that they cannot be emancipatory in incremental ways when attentive to those relations. So in a way, as, as uh, these, these two examples or my fieldwork in, this, in these two settings has allowed me to say or to, to see how obviously power relations are there in prison, power relations are clearly there. And it's true that yoga is a way of disciplining the bodies of the prison. But it's also true that might be uh, a tool to kind of re-narrate uh, their own life and try to uh, address the, pain, the pains of the, of the situation. And in the case of Uruguay and, and Catalonia with these uh, women, spirituality allows them to generate a narrative that makes sense and also relates them with the planet and with the body and with their own practices. So should we know better? Yes, and I think that <laughs> what, what we should do is to kind of rethink our epistemological starting point and, and ask a little bit uh, who portrays whom and for what and in which context and, uh, and try to see that these three big narratives, you know, the, the, the but I say the bullshit narrative, the, the, uh, the scientific narrative and the, and the neoliberal narrative are interesting because they show us something that's going on there, but this is only a side of the story. If we ask different type of questions and we, answer, and we listen seriously and we take the subjects of our fieldwork as seriously as we, want, as we would like to be taken. And this is something important because and it's very basic and maybe very naive, but for me it has been a kind of change in paradigm. This kind of, uh, when I was learning to do sociology, I was told, okay, you have to listen to people, but then you should interpret what the people say. <laughs> and you should really say something different that, uh, of what people are saying. When you find in a position that you are a scholar, but also you are a practitioner, so you, you might be there sometime, you might, might be in the other side of the table, you start thinking, okay, but why should they take me seriously? Mm -hmm. I, what I'm saying, it might not be an answer at all. So why I need another interpretation of what I am saying. So, but also taking them time and a space seriously. And, and this is important when we talk about spirituality. I wrote this book uh, about consuming spirituality 20 years ago. This was 20, 2002. In 2002, uh, maybe this, uh, a spiritual activism was not really clear or it was not that formulated. At least I, I couldn't see this when I was doing this research. Now I clearly can see this. So, I, I, it, and we might think, is spirituality changing? Is our uh, case that is changing? What's going on? And second also, when we think about the object, what exactly means spirituality? And when I try to make sense about what my Kundalini mantra singing might uh, mean, uh, I think that it's time to kind of do this exercise of queer religious and spiritual identities. Maybe we're looking for something that doesn't exist. We're trying to see an equivalent of the religious individual into the spiritual individual. Like we are trying to build a new portrait that fits and kind of uh, generate this kind of nice uh, scheme. And then when you have this structure, the religious, the spiritual, and trying to fit all the categories. But maybe when we talk about the spirituality, we really need to be clear. Maybe it's not an identity of yes or no. Maybe it's much more complicated and maybe the story needs another kind of, uh, of, of, of thinking. But also we need to assume that it's elusive, versatile, and evanescent. And, and maybe but it might be like this, and maybe this is the characteristic. But we have to also to take into account that it might be banal, but it's not trivial. And this is something important because this goes with my last field work, I'm also doing uh, field work among oncological patients that uh, refuse uh, chemo uh, for spiritual reasons. There's a lot of these uh, toxicity ideas that chemo is toxic, that the body can kill itself, and so on, so on. And for me, starting this field work 
it, it oh, and I accept it, it, it was clear that we have been said, we have said for many years that spirituality is a weak attachment. It's something that just super, uh, superficial, that it doesn't really relate to you. But when you see that someone can uh, just decide that they don't or she doesn't want it, because many now we are still in the middle, so I cannot give full results. But many of the, of the persons that re reject a chemo are women in breast cancer situation and highly educated. So it's not, uh, we cannot use this definite knowledge theory, the, the, the theory that says, okay, they are rejecting chemo because they don't know nothing. No, they hope know some more about this. But uh, no, they, they are rejecting because they have another spiritual view, you know, and, and they, they, so we really need to take it uh, seriously. This is, uh, holistic spirituality because it has real consequences in the real world. It's just not something that we make in our mind. No? So it has something out there. So mm -hmm. in order to finish, on my way to Victoria too, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I went to, and, and this is just a small anecdote in order to finish, but also in, in, a, in a way to, in order to problematize a little bit what I was just saying, I, I took the plane, the, the, the route was different. I had to go through Frankfurt and I, in Frankfurt, I took the plane that was uh, going to Vancouver. And when I was seated, I sit uh, next to a sick a couple, a uh, sick and calls sick. And then I realized, I, I, I also put my, my Spotify and I was trying to put my Kundalini mantra list. And I felt that it was not appropriate. I felt kind of mm. shy, like mm. and maybe they realized that I'm listening to Wahe Guru, and they say, what you're listening to? And, and they ask me <laughs> questions, and maybe I'm not allowed to uh, listen to Wahe and, 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 and I have not a clear answer about these kind of uh, questions in my mind. But this reminds me of what Anna seeing in this beautiful uh, book on, on mushrooms. I don't know if you are familiar, but it's beautiful. He, she calls zones of friction. And she says that sometimes this friction, this, 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 the, 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 to put together uh, different types of narrative of different views can generate also new answers and new avenues. No? And, 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 and this, but, uh, to some extent, uh, I think that as a scholars and practitioners, uh, we should be doing, no? try to generate this zone of friction, or, or she also at some point she called zones uh, of awkward engagement, which is also another way to say it, and uh, try to think of spirituality from another point of view. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mar. I, I think I can probably speak on behalf of everybody in the room, perhaps also on Zoom, that we could have listened to you speak uh, all night. That was beautifully done, um, very eloquent as as always, as I've seen for so many years. Um, now we have an opportunity to be in conversation with Anna and, and to have Anna and Mar have some chance to to talk, and then we'll maybe do that for maybe ten or fifteen minutes, um, Anna, and then like you you and I can kind of be in conversation with Mar, and then we kind of open it up to the broader group. Yeah. Great. <clears throat> Uh, great. Well, thank you. Can you hear me? Okay? All right. So first of all, I just want to say um, that was a brilliant uh, and very thought provoking, as always, presentation, Ma. And um, and I also really just want to thank Paul and Rachel and Scott for um, inviting me to Victoria and say, I'm sorry, I'm not there. Uh, in person. Um, I'm not sure if I'm having allergies or a cold and I thought it's just best to keep everyone safe. So um, I'm staying away. But okay. Uh, I loved the Haraway quote, Ma, and um, corrosive skepticism cannot be a midwife to new story. And I think most of what I have to say now and to ask you, you know, to maybe elaborate a little bit about is around this notion of scepticism and trust and, you know, which was a, a, a real theme throughout your presentation. And this notion of also who we, whoever we are supposed to be, who we listen to and who we place our trust in. Uh, so my first question and and... 
when you put up the the three frameworks that you say contemporary scholars of religion approach spirituality the first one this the skeptic's tale i I'd, I'd like to ask you a bit about uh why you think uh that is so dominant and again ask you to maybe speak a little bit about other people's work on this so for example Anna Fidel and Kim Nibbs work on why uh, spirituality, they argue that spirituality, the study of spirituality is marginalized because it is associated with women and the private sphere. And then we've built on that in the Australian context and said that we we totally agree with them, but we also say that the study of spirituality is not, and spirituality is not taken seriously by scholars of religion because it's also associated with indigenous worldviews with Asian worldviews and also with nature, with the the non-human. Um, so I guess my feeling is if we start listening more to the people who the project of modernity has marginalised, uh, perhaps through us studying spiritualities from diverse worldviews and traditions, uh, in that way it can be part of uh, decolonizing and also part of making good trouble and, um, you know, uh, responsibility, the sort of things that you were speaking about at the end of your presentation. So, yeah, I'd just, just really like your thoughts about that, I guess, the connections between um, who's being marginalised in these conversations, how is that impacting the way we see spirituality, and then also now with a current emphasis on you know we there's a decolonial turn in scholarship there's a multi-species turn in scholarship we know more about uh, feminist studies and studies on affect etc yeah how is this present moment in the anthropocene um making us actually yeah maybe want to listen to these stories a bit a bit more <laughs> in terms of how to better live and die well together yeah yeah Thank you very much, Anna. And uh, I would like to apologize because I'm very jet lagged and my English it's not really clear. So, but it's fine. I think we all prefer to be able to speak like you. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> uh, no. Uh, okay. The the skeptic uh, tale. So you were asking who is who is putting forward this kind of uh, narrative, and I. I think that, well, in fact, the first is that I, 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 I kind of live in my own body this narrative because I tried to do my PhD on spirituality and, and I was saying that, that this was not a serious topic, that this could not go forward, that this would uh, not be interesting at all. So we, 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 we know that. And I think that they are mainly the, the, the classical scholars on religion that, as I was saying, the, the spirituality sometimes is... is is a, as I also Anna Fedele and Kim say, it's a difficult uh, construct to grasp. We, we, we are not able to do this categorization, this classification, this clear uh, putting boundaries to, to the spirituality. And, and as academics, you, we usually put boundaries and make classifications and, and generate categories. When something kind of escape this or, or make this exercise much more difficult, uh, it gets in a way uh, problematized by serious academics. No, It's like this might not be serious if we cannot really classify, we cannot really identify, we cannot really define. And maybe in some, in a way, they might be right. So we, we have to be doing this exercise of understanding better what's going on. Uh, but in order to understand, we have to give the field an opportunity. And this is maybe what uh, the Donna Haraway uh, quotation tried to do for me. Like, okay, if we would like to see what's going on, uh, we really need to go out there. And we really need to listen to people, but ask them different questions. If we keep asking the same questions all the time, we will be given the same answers all the time. So, and how to ask these different questions. And here it's much more complicated what you said that maybe spirituality attracts marginalized people or marginalized people in modernity. This I would say yes and no, because as we know, the wellness industry is really there. What's the wellness industry? 
it's spiritual, it's not spiritual. Uh, Geraldine has researched a lot on it also. And, also, and the wellness industry is, is just attracting marginalized people. No, but maybe the wellness industry has got all the attention why all this spirituality that was growing in the margins and with marginalized people was not uh, put into the center. So the narrative of the wellness industry became that central that we couldn't see the rest. No? And, but we, we also cannot deny that the wellness industry is there. And a lot of mornings have been made and have been generated and a lot of, around the world. So, and we have to be aware that these are different stories that go together. But one cannot hide the other, and the other cannot hide the other. So we really need to see both. No? And, and decoloniality and multi-species, I would, I would think that the same, and at the same time, is difficult. And I might confess, when I'm in a plane next to a sick family, and I'm with my kundalini uh, mantra list, I feel like that I'm faking something. Mm -hmm. And, and I totally have this feeling, so I can't avoid this feeling. I'm real? Is this real? But then I ask myself, okay, should I go to Catholicism? Because I was raised as Catholic. Should I start singing Ave Maria? <laughs> but, <laughs> but this doesn't come to me naturally. Why it doesn't come to me? And this is the question. Why it's much easier for me to go to my Kundalini Mantra list and to my uh, Ave Maria or my... Uh, Mm. And, and there's a question there. Also, there's a question of, of, of cultural plausibility. So for me, it's, uh, it's easier to get into the Wahil Guru because I have no clue about the cultural meanings of the Wahil Guru. And it works as a, as a, as a kind of a, a technology of the, of the spiritual, as, as a way to get into this finite province of meaning of this. And, and when I'm in the plane, it's not just that singing internally a mantra because I was not singing loudly. Eh? <laughs> uh, you can but, uh, it's just, I don't think that this is really spiritual, but what calms me, that it brings me to my memories of my yoga retreat, of my teacher training, So, and I have embodied all these memories in my body. And these memories are attached to Kundalini, but are not attached to Catholicism. I'm culturally appropriating Sikhism. Yes, maybe. What can I do? How should I ask it? So I'm not saying that there's not cultural appropriation. Is there cultural And we need to know this. But at the same time, and, and maybe this is, I'm dealing with it I'm all the time thinking and, and I have to find the right answer. But the question is, maybe the question is to ask the no harm question. I'm, it's my practices. Are my practices harming someone? Harming, you would say. Mm -hmm. uh, to what extent, or oh, can I compensate in a way? Uh, should be compensated? Not. I'm kind of paternalistic if I think that a sick person should need my compensation. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that this is what's important in this in this in this uh, debate. Not to think about these areas of friction and to, to to just keep thinking and and dialoguing about ourselves and generating new questions in order to go forward. But I have no clear answers, Anna. Mm -hmm. Anna, could, could I pose a question that I think is kind of behind your, your question? I mean, in, in our field, but not just in our in the sociology of religion, anthropology, religion, religious studies, and let's call that a field, uh, and in the broader public discourse from journalists, lawyers, um, politicians, there is still the question of secularization debate is still very live, right? So I wonder if this question about um, the relevance of talking about spirituality and conducting research on spirituality is in some sense need, needs to be set against the backdrop of the fact that that question hasn't been resolved yet, right? So it's still a, it's still a live question. Many of us who do, do the kind of work that you and I and Anna do and Geraldine and many others in the room do, we don't, I'm not obsessed about answering that question. Mm -hmm. We find other things that are interesting to look at. But the dominant narrative in elite circles is that religion is going away. And so for, for you and Anne and others to come and say, well, yeah, but check out all these other things that seem to be religion adjacent. <laughs> you know? um, and maybe we want to get outside of the frameworks we're using. Um, but then that makes people who are very attached to the secularization hypothesis very nervous because they're whole identity, the identity of their fields, of their 
idea of progress on modernity is very much attached to that claim. So I wonder if you could, because you, you and I have bumped into such folks and um, <laughs> such, dis, let's say, discourses yeah. uh, frequently. And it's a thing we bump into at the center all the time. I just wonder if you could speak to that. It's also a difficult question. The, my, you are totally right. So on the, on the one hand, I love when an answer begins that way. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're good. We need that expression. I'm very much sure it's the answer. No, <laughs> the fact is that, yeah. And I cannot follow now. <laughs> but yeah, you are right. So uh, the debate is, is, is that the secularization uh, question is, is the big question there, no? And it's still the big question there. And we don't know how to answer how to answer really that this, no? And and we got all this pure research data, no? Now it's growing, and but that the religious conservatives are growing, but now these are and, and and we are all the time kind of dealing with and negotiating with this data. But for me, the problem is, is, is a little bit the same, that maybe there's not a single issue narrative. And now I'm appropriating how the Lord does work. No? There's no a single issue struggle. But maybe there's not a single issue narrative. Maybe secularization is. So the fact that I'm singing uh, my Kundalini mantras in a plane made me a, a spiritual, religious person just, or I'm a secular person. Mm -hmm. uh, Maybe we are trying to, to answer a question that cannot be answered in this way. We should agree, okay, if we, we talk about secularization, what we put into the religious uh, box in a way, then we, we can generate some indicators and give some answer. But if we try to answer a question where we, we don't know exactly what we are talking about, we get trapped in a, in a, in a never-ending debate. Mm -hmm. Because if we don't know what's religion, what's spirituality, but then we try to see that secularization. From an analytic perspective, I would say that we have been using the, the, the three classical Bs to me measure secularization, no? believing, belonging, and behaving. No? This, and these are the classical indicators that allow us to, to kind of show how these indicators works with spirit, work with spirituality and with these holistic spiritualities. It is where we have problems because mm -hmm. we, we still don't know. And 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 what I was saying about time and a space, I think that's something important. I think that on the one hand, different kind of contexts might give different kind of indicators. And you talk about, for instance, British Columbia, how this Columbia, how this gives different, but also time. And and here I really think that we we really need to wait. Oh, 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 we really need time and, and see how this is evolving because we don't know. We don't know if Peter Berger would be right and in, in 10 or 15 years this, this would dissolve and new kind of religious identities will uh, come up and these spiritualities. Uh, and we already when the pandemics in a way we saw some of these spiritual identities that became uh, kind of New, more classical religious identities, uh, also in political terms. In, is, is this just a, a trend or we will see? So, so yes, I'm not really answering the question, but I'm just saying that um, maybe it might not be answered. So yeah. and maybe we have to be fine with this, but we don't know. So I think, Anna, um, maybe we can, let's see, uh, do you want to have an, uh, one more question and then we can turn it over to the broader group? Uh, I'm okay like to turn it to the broader group. I have lots of questions, but that's okay. I can ask Maha another time. Well, how about, how about how you ask? Quick, chime in. Uh, Anna, Anna, why don't you ask the first question that will would kind of open the conversation up? Uh, well, just based on what Maha just said then, I'm I'm quite curious. Do you see, uh, again, we've, we've Maha and I have both written on conspirituality. So um, we've, we've, said that in the past, you know, spirituality was very much um, in, in, equated with a kind of like, you know, peace, love and mung beans. It was seen as very like uh, <laughs> non-harmful and non-problematic and that maybe that's also part of the reason why um, it wasn't taken as seriously as other types of religion. Um, do you see that changing? Like when you're saying like over time, watching it, do you think there's more scepticism now 
about spirituality uh, as a result of um, the pandemic, uh, as well as other critiques, obviously, that we've already touched on in terms of um, spirituality and its um, uh, links with consumerism and capitalism. And Yeah, what I, thank you, Anna, for the question. What I think or what I have been analyzing lately, I, in fact, I asked a project about it, but I didn't got it. So sometimes you make an application and you think that's a really good project, but you, you didn't got it. It was, a, a, it was about trying to uh, analyze to what extent spirituality was an explanatory factor for uh, certain political and civic attitudes, no? And, and this was related with the biomedical technologies, with vaccines, but also with other things. And uh, reviewing a bit the literature, we see that, for instance, in the case of vaccines, uh, there's this um, uh, uh, Dutch uh, social psychologist, I think, uh, Rugians and Martens, that they say that the spirituality has become an explanatory factor for anti-vax. In, in many different, in Greece, in, in Czech Republic, in many different European countries. But also when they analyze, for instance, uh, attitudes towards science in the US, they see that clearly spirituality becomes a, a, a factor for predicting uh, anti vax mm -hmm. But then, for instance, religiosity becomes a factor for predicting uh, anti darwinist uh, So there's how spiritualities and, and, and also this kind of more quantitative sociologist, Paul DiMaggio, has a very nice article where he explores how spirituality is, is emerging as a, as, a, as a proper category in the science religion debate. So, in the classical science religion debate, that where the, the science is false and the religious fault, he says, and with a lot of quantitative data, says, okay, the category of a spiritualist emerging as a category that kind of explain something. So, and that is different from the classical religious category. As I said, uh, I, I haven't done this research yet, but I think that's something important there that, and, and that this might be a change and this then also can change the political and academic interest on spirituality because if we start to see that this might predict political attitudes or uh, views of our science, then everything changed a little bit, no? But uh, as I already said, I'm, I'm not fully sure about uh, if this will be the direction that the spirituality will take, or we will see other kind of developments. Good. All right, so we have uh, maybe about 10 minutes or so for some, for some final questions from the community. Um, I guess what I would ask is that those of you who are part of the research uh, team and workshop uh, would maybe defer your questions because we'll have a chance to have dinner with Anna, with, with Mark and Anna, um, and we get to hang out for the next few days. But those of you who are in the room or who are in the Zoom world who want to ask a question, please, please do so now. Gary. Um, thanks so much for the talk. I was really struck by the way the issue of banality came up several times and you drew this lovely distinction between something being banal but not trivial. And um, I guess it's just helpful. I don't know if this is so much a question, but it's a comment. But I think it's helpful to remember that in the modern West, the modern West is extremely good at rendering everything banal, including Western traditions, right? Whether it's Christianity or Shakespeare or whatever. So it shouldn't be surprising that its appropriation of Eastern traditions can look banal at times. But I, I'm wondering to what extent the, the banality in part is a function of the way in which the term spirituality here is, is a kind of synonym for something that purely therapeutic, right? That's purely about overcoming anxiety, dealing with the body and, and sort of psychological issues. Um, and it's not being construed as a discipline designed to put you in touch with reality. Because if, it, if it's understood in this latter sense, then it won't be subject to Zizek's critique, right? Because if all it is is therapeutic, then yeah, it's about helping people conform to the absurdities of late capitalism in as least um, hurtful a way. But if it's about actually coming into contact with realities that are below and above that ideological framework, then it becomes dangerous politically and becomes something quite other. And, and I wonder to what extent the academic discourse around spirituality is actually perpetuating this view of spirituality as therapeutic rather than cutting to the heart of it and saying, actually, it's this other kind of thing. We're complicit in it. Nice. <laughs> no, 
uh, I think that the, the banality, uh, it, it, it's something that has interested me a lot for many years. So trying to uh, also kind of distinguish this thin, thin line between banality and triviality. So to understand that sometimes that something is seen as banal, it doesn't mean that it doesn't have consequences and, and doesn't have real or physical and material consequences. No? But the second thing, you know, Yes, uh, in a way, my example of Uruguay and, and but also another fieldwork that uh, we already published, well, in the book that we published together with Paul, that was this fieldwork on, on public meditations. I did uh, for some time together with Anna Claude, another colleague, we were analyzing these people that gathered together in the city of Barcelona, but also in many cities away, uh, around the world. And this has been generated with this wake up movement related with the Canaan, that they, they, they sit in the in the, the streets of Barcelona uh, to claim for peace, but also during the Catalan crisis, when they were on the parliament, it was like this, they sit for 24 hours in front of the Catalan parliament, meditating. And this was not therapeutic at all. This mm. was, and, and, and for me, what was interesting when I'm interviewing the people that was in this meditation, it was that on the one hand, they really relate their action with the, a, a, a genealogy of political action, so Gandhi, but also other type of Catalan, for instance, um, uh, activists and so on. But and at the same time, and, and this was my interest also for a long time, they really felt that they, they, their meditation could have thaumaturgical effects, so kind of could change the, the atmosphere of the, of, the, of the place. And this just underline that word. It's a great word. Thaumaturgical. Yeah. The, the idea, it really, it, it had an, a, an impact, no? And it was not just meditating there for the sake of meditation. Many of them, not all of them, eh? and, 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 and here there are different type of layers of meaning and people participating, but many of them really thought that the meditation could kind of enlighten the people around and could generate another atmosphere. And, 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 and from this perspective, I was asking myself why we only consider as a social transformation movement, the movement that provokes a material and clear impact, but to what extent why we do not consider that this more thaumaturgical effect that maybe we cannot measure in classical uh, dimension is always making an impact and it's, all, and it's not uh, looking at that therapeutically at, at themselves, it, it really it's oriented towards others. No? And, and this orientation of the spirituality is something that, yeah, you explain it really well. And I think that this is the, the, the importance of, of trying to do this type of field work, showing that not this is not only about myself and how I feel and my self-care, but it's also about that I care for the others. Uh, also yoga volunteers that spend a lot of their time going to the prison without getting paid. Uh, they are not naive at all. They know that they are not going to change the world. But still, they spend two hours a week going there, doing this for. This is not for therapeutic reasons, or not only. Mm. Thank you. Mm. Okay. Um, hi. Um, so I have two questions. Also, your accent's very cute. <laughs> 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 you, and you would know. Catalan accent. Mm. Sorry? And you would know. <laughs> <laughs> That's me. <laughs> So, um, firstly, I'm very curious, your um, inmates, the interlocutors, they called prison a temple. And like, I was thinking, what? Because to me, prison, I mean, that's the last thing I would think, right? Because temple, the first images of a religious spiritual site. So I was very curious why they thought that. My second question was, um, you spoke about in a prison, your inmates felt that they were losing their time. Uh, but uh, being part of yoga made them feel that they're not losing their time, but learning things. So, um, and, and, you know, in Vedic astrology, South Asian culture, that's what's said about life, that when, you know, difficulties are coming your way, uh, you're actually learning things. So is it like, is it culture, South Asian culture, those knowledges, spilling over to your prison inmates in Europe. So that, that's my second question. Yeah. The the first regarding the temple, yeah, this was curious, no, how you can say that uh, also I, I don't know if you have been in a in a prison, but in my 
former <laughs> imagination. <laughs> prison was kind of lonely. I had in my mind Grimes here writing in prison. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and then I, I got into the prison and it was really dirty. Uh, at least a Catalan prison. As if we were comparing fieldwork with a friend that's doing a research in Switzerland. And <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, a prison in Barcelona is really crowded. It's really dirty. So it, it, it's not a, a nice place where you write and you think. And, it, and, and the most kind of um, uh, most difficult thing or the most disturbing thing is this, that you are always with people. And for me, it was telling that these people said this is a temple for exactly the second reason that we put forward, because this this kind of knowledge that I think I say that come from many different sources and they mix in a kind of very loosey batchy way, but it worked for them. It's the idea of this might make sense because time is not stopping here. This we are doing something out of this experience, and and. And just the fact of we are doing something and we are put here for some reason and uh, nothing is a coincidence, but if we are here and, and the suffering may, may allow us to learn something and so on, so on, so on. This gave a total different meaning to their experience in prison. No? It's not just, uh, so it, I need to learn. And for this reason, it was seen as a temple. Uh, this is the difficulties uh, that, and this was an image, and not all, all, all of them use the word temple, but but this idea that, uh, that we are here for some reason and time is not stopping, but we are learning, it was always there. And it, uh, it, it, it's changing the plot of the, of the album, yeah. So we have one minute left. So Shubham, you can ask a pithy haiku type question. And... <laughs> <laughs> and Mar will, Mar will answer as if she's Swiss. <laughs> so, Mark, thank you so much for this amazing presentation. I have three questions and I have a choice that you pick one of these questions. <laughs> because, amazing presentation. So, when you ask this question, and it's out of curiosity, this does not sound like a haiku just yet. <laughs> <laughs> they don't have preambles. <laughs> <laughs> what do yoga practices do to inmates? So there is this already assumption that yoga is doing something to these inmates in the in the in the prison. Now my question, my curiosity to to, uh, to read these inmates is whether do they have any expectations for themselves, or are there some inmates who are reluctant to do these practices? For example, like your data set must be a very diverse set of in with, you say Jason and Mark, but there'll be people who'll be like, no, I don't want to do you. I don't want to play this game at all. You do your thing. I'm just going to go and go for a run if there's an option. And by the way, my idea of prison is very much orange is the new path. To, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> I be fine. <laughs> yeah. My second question is based on the idea of spirituality, how we are defining spirituality in this project, particularly with the second project. And if their own traditions, their own paths, their own quote-unquote religion, which is altogether an ambiguous term, is governing their definition of it, uh, spirituality. Because spirituality is not a monolithic term. What is spiritual for me, maybe not for you, or maybe not for Paul. And third question, the third choice for you is that, uh, the question of real, when you were sitting next to the sick couple and you're thinking about cultural appropriation and I put the other term, cultural appreciation, or you being just you while listening to your yoga, kundalini mantra music. Are we, as the subject, thinking about cultural appropriation and appreciation in our head? Or how, because I also struggle with the same issue. Am I appropriating their culture? And just because I'm born in India or I'm born in quote unquote Hindu family, which I don't believe in. Do I have all the rights to study Sanskrit? Mm -hmm. And what about those other scholars who are in West, white, and they are studying Sanskrit, how they are less trained than me? So these are basic questions, big basic questions. Mm -hmm. And if you want to answer any of these, sure. If you don't want to answer any of these, perfect. But I'll treat you from the best case. Can I answer? In a hyper mode, but in a, <laughs> using my anecdote of the place, I, I, 
it goes a little bit far away, but maybe it tells something. The the birds that crash well, collide with my plane at the beginning were the starlights. I don't know if you know the story of a starlight. They were brought to New York uh, mm -hmm. by a by a man that was part of a what was called climatic society. Uh, it was very funny because during the beginning of the, 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 the 20th century, uh, at the end of the 19th century, all over the world, like all over the Western world, these climatic societies were created. These societies were created by people that consider that it would be a good idea to bring a species from one side to the other. So they put the starlight, which was a bird from I don't know exactly where, to the states. And now there's a problem in the states because there's too much starlights. Starlights. Uh, starlings, yeah. sorry. Okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, in Catalan is Asturnes. Mm -hmm. Starlings. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was thinking, is this have you come have we completely changed the paradigm? Mm -hmm. So at the big one century ago, we considered that it was good kind of bring things from one place to the other. And that because this was kind of a an altruistic and a, how you say this philanthropic society, they were really kind of thinking that this was a very good idea to bring one species from one thing to the other, to to bring one code. And I was thinking it was the same moment in time that the Chicago Parliament mm -hmm. was in the state, mm -hmm. and they were saying, "Viva Canada!" So, and and this was considered a, a kind of a social progress thing. So it was a good thing to do. Nowadays, <coughs> maybe we have switched to the other perspective and, and we have reasons for it. Mm -hmm. But we now consider that maybe it's not appropriate to bring something for another country to here. It would be cultural or species or something. Uh, and, and because this might generate problems and so on. And I think that both perspectives can have problems. Mm -hmm. One, because you, you, you generate the travel, you might travel the, the situation, but the other one also, because maybe you, you would not talk, never, because mm -hmm. if I'm nowhere else. And, 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 I, and I, then with this, with this Kundalini mantra, I thought maybe if I put, had put my Kundalini mantra list next mm -hmm. to this word, women, and well, woman, woman, uh, maybe we, we would have started the conversation. Mm -hmm. And maybe this would have generated something interesting out of it. But I, 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 I turned to my classical music. I thought that it was more appropriate. <laughs> so, but but I, I have not the final answer, but I think that there's some changing paradigm going out there that has happened during the last century. And, and, and both sides have consequences in many in ethical, but also social uh, and cultural. Okay, thank you, Mark. I think probably everyone can understand why I wanted to Mark to be kind of the keynote speaker, the kickoff um, scholar for this conversation. So thanks to those of you who joined us who aren't part of the project, and for those of you who aren't part of the project, now we're gonna go for dinner at Joseph Paragon and uh, so for some appropriate yes for some appropriate <laughs> <laughs> excellent tasty appropriating yes. and uh, just a little note that uh next week um ai buddhas and other delusions so martin adam who's a, a, a faculty member here in our philosophy department uh sorry <laughs> in pacific nation will be with us so please join us uh, same place or sort of the same place we're actually next door same time okay thanks very much again